Good morning. I'm Meredith Broadbent. I run the International Business Program here at CSIS, and I'm very glad to welcome everyone. You know it's a busy morning with a lot of competing events, so we really appreciate your, your presence here. We're here to uh, hear from Chairman uh, David Dreyer from the House Rules Committee, and he's got some legislation uh, addressing the prospect of free trade agreement negotiations with Egypt. Uh, to introduce him is Ambassador Carla Hills, who served as United States Trade Representative in the, the first Bush administration. And I'm going to turn the, the program over to her to take over. Thank you. Thank you, Meredith. It's a great pleasure always to uh, be at CSIS. And Meredith Broadbent has done a terrific job. I hope each one of you have a copy of her report. I read it two days ago, and I think it really sets forth the issues and the importance <coughs> excuse me, of what we're talking about this morning. So if you haven't read it, you can read it after this event. And we are certainly privileged today to have David Dreyer, who is one of the greats in our Congress and represents California's 26th Congressional District. He was elected in uh, 1980 on a platform that supported free markets, strong defense, and personal liberty. And he's remained uh, true to those principles. He has voted for every free trade agreement that has been presented and has supported the president's trade promotion authority regardless of whether the president is a Democrat or a Republican. And as you all know, he chairs the powerful House Rules Committee, a committee that he's served on since 1999. Unlike the Senate, and maybe all of you know this, uh, the House does not have unlimited debate. So the bills go through the uh, uh, Rules Committee rather than going straight to the floor when they are reported out of a committee. And uh, so the House Rules Committee decides uh, what bill will come up and under what circumstances, and the leadership relies incredibly on the Rules Committee and its chair to determine how each bill is determined. And uh, that is incredibly important for trade bills, but for all bills. Uh, chairman Dreyer has been widely applauded for how he's handled his responsibilities. He has earned a 100% approval rating from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the National Association of Manufacturers. He holds a Heroes a Taxpayer Award for American Tax Reform, the Clean Air Award from the Sierra Club. I can go on and on. Literally hundreds of diverse groups have applauded this man. And he's tried to inform the American people of the benefits of trade, regularly pointing out to his audiences that open markets generates jobs, growth, an opportunity, but also builds strong partnerships with key nations around the world and helps us solve transnational issues like environmental degradation or uh, pandemics or national security and uh, does a great job on development like eliminating or reducing global poverty. Uh, last month, he introduced a bipartisan resolution calling for a trade uh, bill with Egypt. And he also traveled last month to Egypt with a bipartisan congressional group to observe the first round of the post-revolution parliamentary elections that took place on November 28th. So we are very, very fortunate to have Chairman Dreyer here to share his views on the future of U.S.-Egypt relations and the role of a free trade uh, agreement negotiation. Chairman Dreyer, the podium is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Ambassador. As you talked about all these diverse groups that uh, that support me, I'm just reminded, I guess I'm making an attempt to be all things to all people, which uh, I know I will fail at uh, ultimately, but uh, you're very kind. Um, Carla has uh, gone through the fact that I'm chairman of the House Rules Committee. I'm pleased to be the chairman of the uh, California Congressional Delegation. I'm chairman of a group that I'm going to talk about, a commission called the House Democracy Partnership. But my real claim to fame is that I'm the chairman of the Carla Hills Fan Club, which uh, is my uh, most uh, important position. And 
I want to say uh, that um, it's great to be here with Meredith and Thelma, her former colleague, uh, and so many people who for such a long period of time have understood the interdependence of economic and political liberalization and the fact that, uh, as Carla just mentioned, not just the economic benefits, but the geopolitical benefits that exist when it comes to the issue of uh, breaking down tariff and non-tariff barriers uh, around the world. Uh, I thought that, um, first of all, let me say uh, to those, I know that Jill Robert was uh, very involved here at CSIS. I know that that service is taking place right now, as Carla has just reminded me, and uh, obviously our thoughts and prayers are with his family. And I said to Carla, while she chose to be here, that he very much would have wanted her to be here, working hard on the goals that CSIS has had. And uh, I, uh, I just want to say that uh, the work that takes place here is very important. I'm privileged to be a member of, I'm embarrassed to say I can't tell you exactly what, what uh, group I'm on, but I'm on one of, your, one of your boards. You work me very hard on it, and obviously I'm engaged in it every single day, as you can, <laughs> as you can tell, but I'm still privileged to, uh, to be part of it and was asked several years ago to do that, frankly, by David Abshire, and, and um, I'm very pleased to, uh, to have an association with CSIS. And I will say that this study and, uh, and other work that you all do uh, really plays, as you know, a big role in public policy and uh, a, a role in the decision-making process in the United States Capitol. And so I, uh, I appreciate the, the very, very uh, intellectually rigorous arguments that you uh, have put forward. Let me uh, take just a few minutes uh, to, to talk about I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just, I, I hesitate to give you a, a travel log of my travels over the last couple of months, but I'm, I'm going to touch on some things because they all are interrelated and they come down to what it is that we're here to uh, discuss today. Uh, in September, uh, I um, went to, to Egypt as part of uh, the House Democracy Partnership, which is a commission that my Democratic colleague David Price and I established uh, seven years ago this coming March. And the goal of the House Democracy Partnership is to look at new and re-emerging democracies around the world and engage in institution building, specifically the legislative branch. And we know so often that that leaders, members of Congress, have a tendency to go into countries and they'll meet with uh, the president or the prime minister and a couple of other ministers and then they have a tendency to leave. And it's, it's important to realize that one of the key things for us to do is to make sure that we develop strong, independent legislative bodies in countries so that they can have an opportunity for oversight uh, of the executive and since legislative bodies are, in most every instance, the direct tie to the people, it's a very important part of representative democracy. And so um, we, in the 1990s, had a commission that I was part of that was focused on Eastern and Central Europe following the crumbling of the Berlin Wall and the demise of the Soviet Union. And uh, we went in and we spent, you know, these parliaments in Warsaw and Hungary and Poland in, in Poland and Hungary and uh, other countries in Eastern and Central Europe. I do know that Warsaw is not a country, by the way. I'm sorry I just <laughs> said it. But, um, but I, I, I will say that, um, that as, we, as we look at the, uh, the, the countries in Eastern and Central Europe, they had parliaments that were simply a rubber stamp for the Soviet Union. So the idea of things that we saw as common sense being developed is what we took on uh, back uh, in the early 1990s. The commission lasted about four or five years, and, uh, but it was successful at helping you build the parliament. So after September 11th, uh, we thought that the idea of recognizing that the development of institutions is going to be critical to dealing with the, the challenge that existed in this decade, uh, we needed to do what we could to look at countries where we have new and re-emerging democracies. And we're partnered with 16 countries around the world, going from uh, uh, Mongolia, Indonesia, East Timor, Haiti, Peru, Colombia, Liberia, Kenya, Lebanon, Kosovo, Macedonia, Ukraine, uh, and uh, Georgia, and Afghanistan, Pakistan, and we just established a program with the Council of Representatives in Iraq. We're looking now at, uh, at South Sudan, 
and several other countries, but obviously the Arab Spring has been an exciting new potential opportunity for us. And so the House Democracy Partnership uh, made this visit in September to Tunisia and Egypt. And um, when I was there, I said to uh, my staff members uh, who are here with me today, I said, you know, what we need to do is, is we need to introduce uh, a resolution and begin moving towards uh, a U.S.-Egypt free trade agreement. And it was received very enthusiastically. The, the American Chamber of Commerce has been very supportive, and we appreciate the, uh, the great work of the AmCham in support of that. But I'm happy to say that throughout uh, the country, I mean, regardless of where people stood, there was an enthusiastic response to the idea of our embarking on a, on a trade agreement uh, with Egypt. And uh, so it went um, extraordinarily well. And uh, we obviously were looking at the wake of the, the revolution and uh, the uh, ouster of Hosni Mubarak and the prospect of, of the elections when I was there in September. And uh, I was asked by our great ambassador, Ann Patterson, to uh, come back for the elections, and we did. And um, I, I will say that uh, there's <clears throat> another trip that I, that I took that is very closely uh, intertwined with this. And I was in Latin America. Uh, I visited six countries in Latin America as we were looking at, uh, at the work of the House Democracy Partnership. And I went to El Salvador. And we all know about the, the challenging relationship in El Salvador, the difficulties went through in the 80s, for those who were old enough, the 80s and, uh, and the 90s. And a message that, uh, that I found in El Salvador was that um, in, in that country, we saw, we see today the FMLN, the Farabundo Marti National Liberation Front, governing the president and the speaker of the parliament in El Salvador. And the reason I say that is that they were the absolute adversary of the United States. And the idea of seeing them embrace democracy and the rule of law is a very important thing. And one of the statements made to me by a Peace Corps volunteer in El Salvador was that El Salvador, uh, Salvadorans have uh, varied views about the nation's past, but they all share the same vision for the future. And when I shared that statement with uh, Secretary Jeff Feltman, who is the Assistant Secretary of State for the Middle East and North Africa, uh, he said to me, in talking about this trade agreement, he said, the interesting thing is, if you look at El Salvador and you look at Egypt, he said, the thing is, is that Egyptians have 50 or 60 different visions for their future. And the idea of a free trade agreement will create an opportunity to allow Egyptians to rally around a common goal, regardless of where they stand on the political spectrum. And so that lesson, the lessons from Eastern and Central Europe and the lessons from this hemisphere can play a role in doing exactly what needs to be done here. Now, uh, I will say that uh, I was very pleased, uh, having been part, having led this International Republican Institute, the IRI election observer team, to see uh, how well the election went. I mean, it was extremely inspiring. And I, and I, and I, you know, I, I can share with you these things. We, we have a tendency to take elections for granted, and I'm on the board of the International Republican Institute, and so I've been able to participate leading election observer teams around the world. I've never been more inspired than I was in Egypt. This was, uh, and, and there have been lots of inspiring opportunities to see this around the world, but this is the first time in 7,000 years, basically world history. And I know people point to the 48 and 52 elections, but they're nothing. But based on what I heard from people who were around there, they're nothing like the election that we have seen. And by the way, I mean, in two hours, the second round uh, will be uh, closing because this is the second round of the election that's taking place today uh, in Egypt. But for me, when I was there uh, talking to people who <clears throat> had just, I mean, one, one man said to me, a 50-year-old man said, um, this is uh, the single most important day of my life. And I said, the most important day of your life? He said, yeah, because this is the first time that I've ever been able to take any step to do anything that plays a role in determining the future of my country that I love so much. Um, I saw 90-year-old women climbing four or five flights of stairs at schools 
so that they could have the chance to vote. Um, one judge and the, the voting boxes in Egypt had, they, they had these, these boxes, but they covered them because they extended the election to a second day. It went the 28th and the 29th, and they had gauze over them, and they would use wax and seal the, uh, the gauze on top of the, of the, uh, of the opening for the, for the box. And at the end of the voting, I was there for the closing as the last voter came in at uh, one of the voting stations. And uh, this judge was there, and he was, had his seal, his little tiny seal that was on his key ring. And what he did was is the, the wax was put onto the gauze as they were doing it, and he kept putting it down, and he licked it every time he was uh, stamping it onto this. And I said... Um, Judge, tell me, what, what does this taste like? And he looked at me and he said, this time it tastes like democracy. And so these anecdotes are, are so important in looking at, at the hopes and aspirations of the Egyptian people. Now, there were projections that the Muslim Brotherhood would have um, as low as a 10% support. One very, very prominent journalist in Cairo told me when I was there in September that the Muslim Brotherhood would not see their vote exceed 10%. I'm not going to say his name because obviously he was very, very wrong. Um, the polling indicated that the Muslim Brotherhood, the Freedom and Justice Party, would have a vote that ranged between 20 and 40%. And we all know that if you combined the vote of the Freedom and Justice Party and the newer party, the Salafist, it's basically two-thirds. And I just, uh, just before coming here, I was telling Ambassador Hills and, and her colleagues here that I, I just had a half an hour conversation with the Chief of Staff for Field Marshal Tantawi in Egypt, General Assar. And he was constantly reaffirming the commitment to democracy and how this has to be done and um, recognition of whoever wins, we have to make sure that we work with them. The point that I like to make is, is that democracy is not simply about elections. One election a democracy does not make. Democracy is about the rule of law, political pluralism, the development of democratic institutions, recognition of women's rights and human rights. And the message of this election that we need to make very clear is that regardless of how people voted, because I talked with people of all ages, and they said that they were voting for the Salafists, they were voting for the Muslim Brotherhood, based on one thing. They wanted jobs and the economy to grow. They weren't campaigning on an issue of abrogating agreements, treaties with Israel. They weren't uh, campaigning on an anti-West platform. They weren't campaigning on a platform of denying alcohol or women's rights or any of that. They were campaigning on one thing and one thing only, and that is they made a commitment that they would get the economy growing. Now, we know the devastation that's taken place since February 11th when Hosni Mubarak uh, left office, <clears throat> and two million jobs have been lost. Two million jobs have been lost since that time, and there is understandable frustration. This is due to a lack of foreign direct investment and due to, because of uncertainty and due to the um, lack of tourism uh, that exists in Egypt. And so steps need to be taken right now to ensure that we can uh, proceed with, uh, so that we can proceed with addressing that need that exists there. There are some things that can be done. The important point that Meredith has made, and a step that I believe we need to take as soon as possible, is to take the very, very outdated bilateral investment treaty, and uh, we need to do what we can to update that and proceed with, uh, with our work on that. And um, obviously, the idea of a free trade agreement is not going to happen overnight. Carl and I were just talking about the fact that we'd worked on the Panama, Colombia, and Korea deals for many, many, many years, and we all know it took over five years since the signing of those agreements to have them pass the United States Congress. Now, that's not, thank God, what it takes for most agreements, but they all take a while. And 
So it's going to be a while before we get to this, and that's why a so-called FTA light, it seems to me, is a very important thing that we should be doing and that we should work on. Uh, and so I hope that we will be able to do that. I also think that there needs to be recognition that Egypt is an exciting country with a tremendous potential. Tremendous potential, and I learned a lot of this when I was meeting with the American Chamber of Commerce, and I happen to like to drink Coke Zero, and I find Coke Zero in foreign countries more than I do in the United States. I just happen to like it. I mean, it allows me to eat six Mrs. Field chocolate chip cookies if I drink a Coke Zero. But to see how Coca-Cola is used in <coughs> Cairo as the launching pad for basically the entire continent is an important thing. And there are other businesses. There are other businesses that will have, <coughs> I believe, great potential to use this country of 85 million people as a base for trade within the Middle East and throughout the continent of Africa. And what we need to do is, is we need to, to create this tie with the United States and our economy and the Egyptian economy, and I think that that will play a big role in helping with the overall shared goal of global economic growth, uh, especially in the region. And so um, engagement is now more important than ever. And uh, I mean, and I made a commitment to do that. I'm going to be going back to Egypt. My plan is to go back to uh, be a witness for the presidential election, which uh, I was just told by uh, General Assar this morning that the election is, is scheduled for around June 20th. And um, they've indicated, of course, that they <coughs> want to turn over the uh, power as, <coughs> as soon as possible. In fact, in September, when I met with Field Marshal Tantawi, when I asked him specifically when he wanted to turn over power, he said yesterday. He said, I'm a, he said, I'm a general. I said, I don't want to run this country. And I know there are lots of questions that have been raised about this, whether they really want to run the country or not. But I do believe that we need to recognize that um, there is going to be a presidential election. A constitution is going to be put in place following these parliamentary elections. And our active involvement and working with and developing a relationship with those who are elected is critical to dealing with the shared concerns that we have. And uh, the work that CSIS is doing is playing a, a big role in that. And I appreciate the fact that this report and other things that you're going to do will be continuing to strengthen us with that. So thank you all very much. And it's a great honor to be here. And I look forward to taking some questions. Love to take some questions. Well, let me start with uh, one. You focused a lot on um, the, uh, what needs to be done in Egypt. And my question is, how do we sell it at home? We're in a fragile fiscal circumstance, and we've been, uh, in the past, giving Egypt a lot of money. Um, but as I read the report, uh, the United States would gain hugely in terms of getting on the uh, stage with respect to opening the Egyptian market, which is strategically located economically. Mm -hmm. uh, how, talk a little bit about the benefits to the United States in terms of its growth, its security in uh, the Middle East, North Africa, its opportunities to uh, reduce its development budget by doing things that don't take money. Uh, you've been there and you've seen it firsthand. You know, you would think that Carla Hills was the one who has to stand before the voters, not me, uh, in, uh, in throwing that out there. You're absolutely right. Uh, we need to underscore the fact that this is uh, a win-win. Uh, what is it that um, can be done to let the American people know? Well, for starters, as we know, Egypt is the recipient of the second largest foreign assistance package, $1.3 billion in the world that we provide. and. Uh, I think that um, personally, the idea, I always like to throw this out, this is in, in making this appeal, trade, not aid. I prefer trade to aid. And the no notion of you know, economic growth in Egypt when they're dealing with so many problems today 
is something that can appeal. And I always say, when you've got 85 million consumers, and if you, if you think about the fact, and we were, I was talking with Ambassador Patterson about this, what would be the immediate benefit uh, in uh, Egypt right now if we were to proceed with an FTA? Well, the automobile industry in the United States would be an immediate beneficiary of this, because right now Europe is exporting greatly into Egypt. And for us to have an opportunity to compete uh, with that would be a great job creator for organized labor here in the United States. And this is, I mean, I look at, at Thelma and, and with Meredith here, this has always been such a point of very, very the great frustration for so many of us, and of course, in Pastor Hills. And that is the fact that organized labor doesn't recognize that, that rank and file union members are the greatest beneficiaries of these market opening opportunities for us. And I think that uh, th that industry alone. I talked about Coca-Cola. There are other tech country, you know, tech companies. Or frankly, I mean, under Mubarak, uh, I, I was I was in uh, I was in Egypt in '05 and um, and met with uh, and met with with uh, President Mubarak then, of course. And actually, I encouraged him to have election observers coming in just before the '05 election. Uh, he didn't respond too positively to me then, but um, but I met with uh, with Prime Minister Najif, who I know is now in uh, in prison, unfortunately. But he took very very bold steps towards economic liberalization within Egypt then, and I visited him in the Smart Village, which is where Microsoft and other tech uh, companies have uh, great operations there. The idea of, of uh, expanding what is our comparative advantage in those fields, I mean, whether it's the tech area, uh, other areas where we have a comparative advantage, I think can, can go a long way towards boosting it. And this is something that, that we all find, those of us who travel internationally around the world, people want to have access to U.S. goods and services. Consumers stop me on the streets and say, we would love to have more American products here. I mean, I got that in Mexico when we were debating the North American Free Trade Agreement. I find it all over the world. And in Egypt, I found the same thing uh, when I've been there recently. They want to have access to it, and they love the idea of having a, a tie to us. So what it says is they want to have access to it. What does it mean? It means they want to be able to purchase U.S. manufactured goods and our services. And so that's the argument that we need to, to put forward, is it's a great new market for us that uh, does not exist today as well as it could. And we're losing out because Europe has an arrangement. Exactly so uh, let's elements. go to the floor. I don't want to, I saw a lot of hands go up. Thelma. Well, Thelma, you get first crack. Thanks. Uh, we often in FTAs uh, focus on uh, the difficult part, the how long it takes, right. uh, how difficult it is in Congress, how difficult the implementation process By the way, it's is. gotten a lot harder since you left, Thelma. I just want you to know that. <laughs> no, no. Uh, <laughs> but I think we lose sight of the fact, in my view anyway, the most important thing about FTAs is the process of negotiation. Because countries do things unilaterally while they're in that process. Mm -hmm. Uh, FTAs generally have a multilateral context. They right. get countries to see what they're broader obligations might be. And so um, I think the process, just getting into the negotiations and working toward ticking off each uh, uh, kind of part of the agreement is almost as important as, as reaching mm -hmm. the conclusion in five years after difficult right. fights in Congress. So w what do you see as the best way to kind of jumpstart that beginning and focus on the benefits of the process mm -hmm. rather than the disadvantages that you might face later yeah. as you focus yeah. on the implementation process and the concluding elements of it. NAFTA was a good example, and I think all these FTAs, most countries undertake those obligations through various other avenues, uh, GSP, right. et cetera, during the process right. of the negotiation. Well, I mean, it's a it's a uh, it's a great point, Thelma, and you're you're right. I mean, I I would argue that uh, you know this first of all, th this idea has been thrown out in past years, and I got my colleague uh, Congressman Gregory Meeks to join with me, uh, as who's a great free trader, and he's a co-sponsor of this. I should say that uh, that my colleague John Kerry was just there uh, this past week. And I'm hoping very much I'm going to talk to him about the idea of making this a bicameral, bipartisan 
uh, effort in, in, and so in light of that, I think that just the idea of talking on the, about this, and I found this with introducing other FTAs in other, I have a U.S.-Georgia free trade agreement, and as you, we know about the challenges that exist there, and we talk about the geopolitical ramifications of it as long, along with the economic benefits, and so those, just the step of introducing it has had a salutary effect on, on many areas, and I think that, again, as Secretary Feltman said to me, since there is such a, a, a diversity of the vision that Egyptians have, the idea of being able to rally around this can go a long way towards helping it. And the other thing is Meredith's work. I mean, her work product, focusing on the bit and any other incremental steps that we can take in this process of getting ultimately to an FTA will, uh, will, will bring, again, immediate benefits. And I'd like to think that we've been able to, just by introduction of this, been able to have a, a positive impact. Because again, I will tell you that I met with a wide range of political parties, uh, and people with very diverse views when I was in Egypt, and uh, I always talked about the FTA. And, that, and no one said, oh, we can't do that. No one told me that they were opposed to it. I mean, people were enthusiastic about it. And so I think just the idea of, frankly, just talking about it and pursuing it, saying that the United States, there, there are people in the United States who want to, to pursue this. And then um, GSP and other things and the bit, uh, you know, updating, those kinds of things, I think, can take place, you know, in, in the process itself. <laughs> Of course, to ultimately do this, we've got to get Trade Promotion Authority back, too, which is another big battle. Yes, please. Would you state your name and uh, affiliation? Thank you. Uh, Brian Riley from the Heritage Foundation. And uh, Congressman, thank you for your leadership, not just on this issue, uh, but on free trade issues generally. Thank I'm you, looking at uh, page seven of Meredith's uh, study in particular. Doesn't have to answer that question. <laughs> What's the question? Uh, I noticed. What's the question? No, I don't know. No, I'm okay. <laughs> About half of our imports, if I'm reading it correctly, from Egypt, are uh, textiles, cottons, textiles, and apparel. And my my question is, um, uh, free trade agreements, great idea. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no reason the U.S. couldn't just get rid of our tariffs on textiles or shoes or products like that. I, I think many of us in this room, including at that table, would probably agree that that would be a good idea in our interest. Uh, my question specifically is things have changed a lot since you were elected in 1980. Uh, congressionally, among your colleagues, uh, would there be any chance of the United States moving in that direction? Uh, Thank you. Well, I, I mean, I would say that the changes since 1980 have been positive. Uh, they've been positive in that there is a, a recognition of shifts that, that, that take place. I mean, Professor Michael Porter at Harvard has done this great study in which he, in which he looked at, you know, throughout history, movements not, not only taking place within the United States, but globally. And so these, the, there is recognition of these shifts. So, you know, my colleagues in the Congress who represent what has been over the last several decades, I mean, the textile industry was obviously in New England before, but I mean, over the last several decades, the textile industry has been based in the Southeast. And now with BMW plants opening in South Carolina and, and all with, with, with all due respect to my great friend Roger Milliken, the arguments that have been put forward in opposition to uh, this notion of, of trade, uh, you know, I think that, that we've really, well, and, and I just point to the votes that we had on our FTAs, the, the Korea, Panama, and the Columbia FTAs. And I'll, I'll give you a, a little insight, and I'm not going to name any members in particular, but when I've worked on this issue back, you know, with Carla and Meredith and Thelma and others for years, we would have a block of members, uh, Republican members, who just did not even want to hear anything of, uh, of this trade thing because textiles was a big part of it. Of the new, there are 89 new Republican members uh, who, who were elected and uh, very, about seven or eight new Democratic members. I've spent a lot of time with, with uh, the new members talking about the issue of trade, and I've been very encouraged to see some members who I assumed would just 
put up a, a, a block to any effort to do this, coming to be saying, we understand and know that this is the right thing to do. I want to figure out how I can work with my constituents to get there. And guess what? Most of these members, of these newer members, most of these newer members were supportive, and I think that they would be, there are going to be concerns. And we all recognize that some displacement takes place, even though we argue that trade is not a zero-sum game and it's a win-win, we know that overall. We recognize that there are some problems. But the fact that we have our members wanting to work through this thing, Brian, is, I think, a very positive thing. And I'm encouraged by that. Yes, over here, uh, Jim. Thank you. Uh, Jim Berger from Washington Trade Daily. Hey, Jim. Uh, Mr. Dreyer, you talked about uh, uh, what a good idea this uh, Egypt FTA is. Uh, the Egyptian people, the Egyptian political parties, U.S. Chamber. Uh, supports it, but the last hills. You call it, yeah. Well, <laughs> but the last time I talked to U.S. Trade Representative a couple of weeks ago, uh, he said it ain't going to happen anytime soon. Mm -hmm. um, would you bring this resolution to the floor from your committee? Or would well, you uh, Jim, let me just tell you that um, I've talked to the U.S. Trade Representative about this as well. I mean, I talked to him just this this past week. I told him what what we uh, have done, and. Um, and actually, Ambassador Hills, uh, when we were in the green room just before we were coming out, recognized that in, a, in the, an election year, it's, it's uh, challenging to do this. Um, I, we have just gone through uh, three you know, very, very uh, challenging trade votes uh, in the House, I mean, our, our votes that we had for our three trade agreements. And um, in light of that, I, I'm, I'm not going to tell you that we're going to report this out because, frankly, we have, a, you know, there are concerns that exist there. And so I can't tell you that this is on the schedule, Jim, but I will, I will assure you that I'm going to continue to uh, work with closely, and I'm, I'm, I consider uh, Ambassador Kirk, and, and I've talked with President Obama about this as well, and uh, as recently as last week, I talked to the president about just the overall trade agenda and how we need to uh, continue to uh, focus on this. And uh, I think that the success that we're going to have with the three trade agreements that have passed, I think, can go away towards, uh, towards helping us with things like a U.S.-Egypt free trade agreement and at least laying the groundwork for it. Um, but I can't give you a schedule as to when we're going to bring this up. Yes, hand right there in the middle. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ibrahim Hussein. I am an Egyptian American who is, lives here in Washington, DC. Uh, I really personally, and I am a member of the Alliance of Egyptian Americans, who are Egyptian Americans living here and active in Egyptian American relationship. Did you vote in the election, by the way? I did not register to vote before during Mubarak's election because mm -hmm. I felt it was a waste of time. Right. But I registered for ID card and mm -hmm. I hopefully get to vote for the presidential election in a future election. Good. But that's a very good question. Uh, I'd like to ask about... I just wanted to get another anecdote. I mean, since I got him from so many voters there, I wanted an anecdote <laughs> from somebody in the United States who'd voted. I, I just want to say I really admire what you had to say and fully agree. And it's beautiful to hear a congressman uh, who is, have such a good insight of what's going on there. And I really love Meredith. I look at your handout here, the, the word hesitant policy, U.S. hesitant policy toward Egypt. And I think it's a very good description. So uh, I hope that Obama administration will stop being so hesitant. Uh, my question is, as an Egyptian American living here, what can we do as an individual or organization to help move the issues that you discussed both here and in Egypt? Well, the first thing that you can do is, is come to and participate in CSIS programs, uh, which you obviously uh, have done. And I want to express my appreciation for that. First, uh, thank you. Thank you for your very kind words. And uh, I'm, I'm flattered by that, and I appreciate it. And it buoys me to continue uh, with the work that we're doing. I mean, talk about this to people in the United States, whatever groups you have. Talk about the, the benefits of this. Get as much information that you can from your um, fellow Egyptians 
uh, and uh, I would I would do uh, everything that you can to get as much insight. And I I think that uh, you know do, doing the things that are natural. I mean, go online and communicate with people. Uh, write letters to the editor about the benefits of this kind of idea. I mean, just the kinds of of you share this this view. You're in a very unique position. You're in a much better position than I, with some constituencies to talk about this uh, as someone uh, in this country. And so, I mean, if you have organizations here in the United States, uh, we'd be happy to do anything we can to help facilitate or get information. You have Meredith's uh, great study, so that's um, something that you can use as a basis for it. So, over, uh, yes, please. microphone is coming. Mm. Salah Ruiz, Towson University, and I'm an engineering consultant in the energy storage area. I have two points here and still uh, they are not clear to me right now. Uh, a few weeks ago, the Minister of International Cooperation, Faiza Bunaga, the Egyptian, she was here and one of the points on her agenda is asking the U.S. administration to stop the U.S. aid to Egypt and the administration declined. That's number one. It's unclear. Uh, everybody's talking about the aid to Egypt and billions and that stuff. Here is an official comes and asking for stopping this aid and the administration declines. Uh, the other point which is still very unclear to me, what would be the relationship or the impact of the quiz on the free trade agreement? And how would be the relationship between the two? Right, right. Thank you so much. Uh, well, the the issue of the QIZs was discussed at our breakfast at the uh, at the Chamber of Commerce, and I I, I believe that the QIZ, uh, the Qualified Industrial Zones, is basically the uh, really the basis from which we can build on an ultimate free trade agreement. To Thelma's point, every single thing that we do on the issue of eliminating any barriers is a step in our quest for the complete elimination of, of those barriers, which is what a free trade agreement ultimately brings about. As far as the, the issue of aid, I know that they're working with the, the, uh, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, the SCAF, and, uh, and others uh, in Egypt uh, there is a lot of talk and the need because of the economic challenges that exist there for uh, continued assistance. And uh, there are varied views on exactly where that assistance should go. And I, I mean, I'm the first to admit it, having spoken with um, a broad range of Egyptians, there are lots of views as to how it should be handled. Uh, and I will, uh, to be very honest, I will say that I, I am, and to get to Carla's original point, uh, somewhat troubled that there's some people in Egypt who see the $1.3 billion assistance as an entitlement, and that we in the United States have no right whatsoever and to, to, to scrutinize this or to, to look carefully at exactly how our taxpayer dollars are uh, expended. And to let Carla know that I do have her message about the, uh, the imperative of watching our tax dollars carefully. I have always said in my meetings with, uh, with Field Marshal Tantawi, with General Assar, and the conversation I had just before coming over here, uh, I reminded him of the economic challenges that we have in the United States, and I reminded him how precious every taxpayer dollar is. Because, I mean, I have friends in Los Angeles, the area that I represent, who've lost their homes, who've lost their businesses, who've lost their jobs, and are suffering. And so the, the responsibility that I have as a member of Congress to oversee how foreign assistance dollars are expended is a, a very, very, it's, it's an important one that I take seriously. And so we are going to uh, continue to scrutinize it. Now, having said that, I do believe that that Egypt is an extraordinarily important ally. They are the leader when it comes to the, the Arab awakening, the Arab Spring. And uh, I think that um, we will be, um, again, it would be a mistake for us to turn our backs, which I think some people 
and even some of my colleagues have, uh, have advocated, and uh, I'm going to do everything that I can to ensure that that doesn't happen. Yes, please. Thank you, Ambassador Hills. I'm Bob Castro, and I'm an independent consultant on my way to live in Cairo and, uh, and work for the next few years. And his wife is a very important Foreign Service officer. Thank so you. I used to be a government official with these yeah, folks, but right. I, I kind of handed over those reins. It's clear that there's not just the economic benefit both ways, but there's the strategic benefit mm -hmm. and the potential strategic loss out if the U.S. doesn't act sooner. And Meredith brought that to light uh, last month with a great forum with our European counterparts and the assistant USTR. But I'm also concerned about China and other potentially street strategic adversaries, if you want to call them that. How much does that resonate with constituencies that you represent, Congressman Dreyer, with other members, that it's not just about the economic benefit we gain now, but every minute we wait potentially allows China or other foreign investors to gain greater influence in that region? Well, Bob, it's, it's a, a very powerful one, and um, not to uh, get too off topic, but I mean, yesterday I was uh, managing the debate on the, on the House floor for our so-called tax extenders bill, for the rule on that, uh, leading up to, to my friend Dave Camp, the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, uh, managing that. And um, the issue is the Keystone Pipeline, Keystone XL Pipeline, which everyone sees in the news. And uh, I'm a strong proponent of our proceeding with that, uh, obviously. And China comes into the equation here. We have a very important alliance with Canada. I mean, massive trading partner and, and all. And understandably, the Canadians are looking for a market. And if we're not going to provide that, they are going to, uh, to be doing that. Similarly, we need to take the same uh, approach, uh, I believe, um, with Egypt. I, I don't fault any country that looks to find a market or uh, find a producer for a product that they want. I don't fault any country in the world for trying to do that. But as Carlos said, when it comes to automobiles and the agreement that Egypt has in Europe and the potential for us with an FTA to immediately see our vehicles have a, a market in Egypt, we need to get into the game. You know, I'm, I've always subscribed to that view. If we don't shape the global economy, we will be shaped by it. Now, having said that, Bob, I'm always sensitive, and the, the economist coined the, the, the great term, we want to be careful about the made in America stamp on the Arab awakening, the Arab Spring. We want to be careful about that. So that's why what I always say is we want to share our experience. We want to create an opportunity for uh, those who are going through this, this great change. And I like to say also, we don't have all the answers. We just have 222 years of experience is uh, what we want to share. I think we have uh, time for one more question. All right, there, right there, young lady. Good morning, I'm Dawn Huschel. I'm the Egypt Desk Officer at USAID. Mm, thank um, you. I Got a great a program going over there, thank you. Thanks. Uh, I have a question about, I understand that we're, we're having an internal dialogue on the Hill and within the administration about what we can do to advance the trade agenda in Egypt. I'm, I'm wondering what specific, given that it's a transition government and we've had several different ministers of trade that we've been, have served as our counterparts, what specific measures or what specific signals can we look for to indicate that the Egyptians are ready to begin negotiations? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I will, s you, you mean negotiations on the trade issue? Oh, well, I mean, I, I believe, <laughs> let me just say that, I mean, from the SCAF to political party leaders, uh, there is a great interest and an enthusiasm uh, for this. In fact, I mean, at the, at the, the meeting that I had uh, with the SCAF uh, just a, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I had already introduced this, and uh, they brought this up, and they said, I made a commitment to Field Marshal Tantawi in September that I would do this. So they're enthused about it. So I think that they are ready to go. I just have not found opposition. Um, actually, I shouldn't say that I found no opposition, because I found a little bit of opposition concern. Actually, I had an intern from Alexandria who was working in my office, and she, uh, I'm still going through the education process with her on the benefits of trade. Uh, but, but, um, but, um, but, but people in governmental positions, I, I, I found, and, and uh, business people and all, certainly a very high level. So I think they're raring to go. It's, it's up to us to, I think, move this as quickly as we can. 
So. Well, I, I think you'll all agree with me that we have been uh, very, very well served by having uh, Chairman Dreyer uh, accept our invitation. And uh, keep in mind that uh, this free trade agreement that he's been talking about is not only important for the United States in a strategic sense, with Egypt sitting right there with the Suez Canal and uh, the, largest, the largest population center for development, for our own benefit in terms of uh, trade and opportunity. And let's do everything we can to help him move his bipartisan agenda forward. So we congratulate you on Thank all you. you've done and all you're doing. And uh, we're terribly grateful that you took Thank the time you. out. So, uh, and you can all thanks. see why I'm the chairman of the Carla Hills Fan Club, too. So, <laughs> Thank you very much, Carla.